Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We've been involved in a series that we've entitled, Hello, My Name is John. And the reason we've taken that title is based on the first part of chapter 1, where John says, listen folks, there's been some things that I have seen there's been some situations that I've been involved in and I've walked with Jesus and I want to share with you a little bit of my testimony. And in 1 John, John is really just getting down to some of the basics of the Christian life. And so as we've worked our way through this little book of the Bible on some Sunday evenings together, we're going to pick up at verse number 12 and we are actually going to move through chapter 5 and verse number 3 as the Lord would have us to. What I have done this evening is I have combined about four different messages together from the end of 1 John chapter 4 to bring about a message that I've entitled, Love is So Important. Love is Important. Let's read together verse number 12 and move forward. The Bible says, Now, no man has seen God at any time, If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that call or call, excuse me, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Then verse 19, we love him because, help me out, church, he first loved us. Let's pray. And let's ask that we would understand how important love is. Lord, whether folks are following along, taking their own notes, or whether they're uh, in our app and following along via digital outline, or whether they're live stream or present here with us tonight, we are simply praying that you would take the message of the Word of God and that you, in all simplicity, would challenge us through what is considered to be foolish, preaching of the Word of God. I pray that we would be ever so careful to understand what the will of the Lord is and help us to see very clearly how important loving you and loving others really is. Even though it's so simple, we understand it can be so very hard. We ask this all now in Jesus' name and all God's people prayed and said. First of all, let's understand the traces of love in us. Traces of love in us. Look at verse number 12 to understand our first point, and that is God is seen through our love. It says in verse number 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. I I just simply for a very short moment want to bring out the fact that one of the ways This world is going to see a glimpse of God is through you. And we understand that Moses had only a glimpse of God for fear of it taking his life. And we recognize in the Old Testament that God showed up in various forms and fashions, but no man hath actually seen God himself at any time. This verse in the Bible would be a very good one to mark if somebody ever came to you and says, I have seen. God. My dear friends, one of the ways that people see and know a testimony of the Lord is because they see and they know you. As we read verse number 12 again, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. His love is perfected in us. Now, I don't understand why it is this way, but it is this way. That love that God has, that he wants other people to know about, the way that 
they see it and understand it and feel it is through the work that God is doing in you and God is doing in me. So guess what the problem is? If I am not living in light of the love of God, that completion is not being made. And guess what? Other people aren't seeing God through us the way that it could be seen or he could be seen. Now let's move on to verse number 13 for time's sake. Number two, the Spirit is our evidence that God is in us. Look at verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and He in us, because He hath given us of His Spirit. Now, if you want to take some time to listen to Sunday school, you can go back and do so. But Sunday school's lesson was on the spirit-filled life. And it is evidenced in your life and mine when God is in us. Man, think about the greatness of God. Think about the majesty of God. And yet God says, I want all of that to be in you. And I want it to show out somewhere. Think about it like this. If something as big as God gets inside of you, it ought to be revealed somewhere in your life. There will be evidences in a person's life as to whether or not they are truly born again. The Bible says it like this in Matthew chapter 7. By their fruits ye shall know them. It will be evidenced as to whether or not someone is truly born again. Now number 3, we move on to read verses 14 and 15. Number 3, we testify of Jesus being the power to save. Look at verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. What I want you to notice is the word confess there. Most of the time people think of confessing Jesus as being at the day of one's salvation. But my dear friend, when you confess Jesus for salvation, your confessing Jesus does not stop there. The confessing of Jesus is something that you continually do. I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. People are going to know from me this testimony that Jesus is the Son of God. As Ms. Sue was talking about, it's not that you can just believe in God and expect that one of these days God's just going to allow you in. For the devils, even they believe and they tremble. As a born-again believer, we are to show the love of God. God the spirit spirit is the evidence of God in us but then we testify to the world that Jesus has the power and is the power to save now as we talk about our next portion of scripture here I want you to see love perfected traces of love in us it ought to be seen in us but now let's talk about love perfected look at verse 16 and 17 and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. The very definition of love is God. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. First of all, underneath love perfected, let's talk about gaining boldness for judgment day. As we looked at verse number 17, something very interesting is pointed out here. Notice it again. Herein is our love made perfect. Okay, we need that completeness in love that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, and then it continues with, because as he is, so are we in this world. I want you to take your Bible and go back to the book of Corinthians. I want to point out to you Corinthians 13. You know this chapter, but I want to link it to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. Because we look at 1 Corinthians 13 and we say, oh, this is that ooey, gooey, mushy love chapter that they like to quote in weddings. And really they are some good, good verses to be able to bring out when somebody is getting married. But look at this chapter and understand the basis for the talk of charity. Look at what it says in verse number 1. Paul says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not what 
This is that same agape love that we're talking about in 1 John chapter 4. That supreme benevolent love of God. If I do not have charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now just imagine getting several instruments up here without any music. And you just tell the one on the cymbal to start hitting the cymbal. You tell the one on the brass to start playing the brass. You tell somebody else over here to start playing what they're playing. But there's no organization. Uh, there's no unity together. It's going to sound like a mess. And you're going to come in and you're going to say, stop it. Stop it. You know what God says about some people speaking? Some pastors speaking, it just sounds like sounding brass or tinkling cymbals because the man who's speaking does not have the motive of charity. Then look at verse number two. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, you know, linked together with a message on prayer this morning, could be a message on faith. Believing, praying, ye shall receive. But I'm telling you, Paul says, I could have all the faith in the world so that I could remove mountains and have not charity. He says what? I am doesn't that link so well to what we are talking about in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17? Look at verse number 3 of 1 Corinthians 13. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, whoa, Paul, and have not charity. Now I realize today that you can just do things out of flippant mundane routine but certainly somebody who would go to the burn pile to be martyred for Christ, certainly they would have the right motive. But Paul understood something about his day. In a day when people were going to be burned for Christ, Paul would sadly look out and see that there were these many people in the name of Jesus being burned at the stake. But Paul would weep because he knew that they were not there with the right motive. That being the motive of charity. And Paul likens it to himself and says, Even if I would give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Then he says in verse number 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. You see, a person who has a true motive of charity is someone who says, I want to know what the truth is. I don't want to run with the way of iniquity. I want to rejoice in what the truth is. Uh, give me something that's solid. Give me something that is sure. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. The word of God is the only standard that will never change. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word Word is settled in heaven. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey unto my mouth. And charity says, I rejoice in the truth of God's word. Then he says in verse number 7, That charity beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never, what? Faileth. Go back with me if you would to 1 John chapter 4 and look at verse 17 again. We're talking about that charity, that agape love, that, that love that is so supreme that it surpasses a, a phileo kind of love, a brotherly uh, kind of love. It, it surpasses a, a, a love that is the worldly driven flesh. This love right here is made perfect in God and through God that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I can stand confidently before God one day because I know that with what I have done with my life, I haven't done it with an impure motive, but I've done it with a love that amazes. And that's what ought to motivate us in every area of our lives. Amen. Look at what it says in verse number 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath what? Torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Number two, underneath this point, there's two choices. And one's going to win every single time. 
You can choose to have the love of God or you can choose to have the fear. Fear of government, fear of man, fear of life, fear of situations, fear of whatever. But fear or love, one of the two is going to win. I want to ask you, which one will win in your life? Now as I read verse number 18, there is an awesome illustration we've used before. But I can liken it now to thinking about one of these days in Peoria, Illinois, at 1109 Brook Hill Road, where I reside, in the middle of the night, there's going to be this thunder crash. There's going to be this lightning strike. There's going to be this little squeal come from the other room. There's going to be a door flung open. There's going to be the pitter-patter of little feet. There's going to be a door in our room flung open. There's going to be a little girl who either stands there or jumps directly into our bed based upon her personality. And you know what's happening at that moment? It's not that mom and dad gets up and says to the storm, Peace, be still. And there was a great calm. I can't do that. But what has actually happened in that very moment is what struck that little girl or will strike that little girl with fear. All of that fear has now been surpassed. All of that fear has now been overcome because she places herself in the arms that she knows loves her. And as we read verse 18, it comes even more alive. There is no fear in love. The moment you step away from that love and put yourself in a situation where fear is all around you, you'll find that there is torment. But the moment you get to that place of love, which is defined solely in God, you will find that even though the thunder still crashing and even though the lightning still striking, you will find that you are embraced with something that is so comforting and it's called perfect love. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Take your Bible and go with me backwards to the book of Timothy. We're looking at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. A verse that you may have memorized, but in 2 Timothy chapter 1, I want to remind you of it. It's such a powerful verse. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of So anytime you have fear in your life, guess who did not give it? God. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. But what does God give? He gives us power and of, there's our word, love. And of a what? Sound mind. We do realize, right, that in most situations where we are scared to death, in most situations where we are afraid of man, afraid of government, afraid of a situation, we realize that the battleground is probably right here more than it is anywhere else. It's in the mind. And God has not given you that spirit of fear, friend, but God will give you that spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. But you got to get to that place where he is. You have to embrace that relationship and that walk with him or you might find yourself still dwindling away in the torments that fear brings. Two choices, run to love, run to fear, which will you run to? As our love is perfected, it's perfected as we get to Him. Then let's look at the reason I love God. Look at verse 19. We love Him because He first loved us. I want to list a few things very quickly. Number one, the reason I love God is because He first loved me. Number two, the reason I love God is because he loved me when I was deep in sin. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. We will realize tonight that we can love him for many reasons. I love him because when I was ignorant to what I needed, he still loved me. I love him. He loved me when I was denied or denying my need of him. The Bible tells me in the book of Romans, that he loved me even when I was in sin. And I'm so thankful today that the reason why I stand before you and can ever say I love God is because way back when he loved me, when he knew me as wretched, knew me as undone, knew me as sinking in the mire of this world, 
The reason I love God. Look with me at verse number 20. Let's understand a little bit about hypocrisy in love. Hypocrisy in love. Now you've seen me do this before, but there's many times where I ask a question to a congregation. I say this, if you love God, would you raise your hand? And so tonight, if you love God, would you raise your hand? Preacher, yes. Yes, I love God. Then look at these verses and examine your heart. Here's a little hypocrisy in love. If a man say, here's what we just asked, I love God, but then note this, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? In this hypocrisy of love, number one, you can't love God and hate your brother. It is an impossibility to be right with him but wrong with them. You see, there's relationships on this earth, but they're all boiled down to two relationships. Number one is my relationship with God or your relationship with God. I call it your vertical relationship. The second relationship category is your horizontal relationship, your relationship with man. Now, you can start with a circle and understand that, that if you're married and have a family, your relationships that are closest to you are that of your spouse and your children. Then it moves on to your families and your in-laws. Ooh, your in-laws, I just can't stand. And they go further from there. I, I don't tell jokes about in-laws because I love my in-laws very much. They're very sweet to me. They, they let me eat cookies and ice cream when I'm there, and that's a wonderful thing. But this, this horizontal relationship is, is something that often we forget or we neglect. So we have our vertical relationship and we have our horizontal relationship. And God says there will be people who will be so bold as to say, I love God. But then they will hate their brother. Something is wrong based according to God's word. See, sometimes this happens in church, doesn't it? The old shotgun thing. The preacher's preaching the word of God. And you're sitting there in your pew and you're saying, Preacher, oh man, that was good for somebody else over there. Boom, just go ahead and let it go, preacher. You're doing pretty good right there. You see, but what we need more than that is a woe is me like Isaiah had. Lord, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. It would be far better if we came into the house of God without a critical eye towards somebody else, but rather an examination of our own life before others and before Him. This hypocrisy in love says, I'm in love with God, but I hate my brother. That's an impossibility. You cannot be in love with God truly. If you don't love your brother. Number two, to love God will be to love your brother. Look at verse 21. It says, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother. Uh oh. Also, are you serious? I had to come to church tonight, I had to hear this message. Because there's just this person in my life. And every time I get in the same room as them, preacher, you just don't understand it. It's like my little heart is taken that was so big and it's made to the size of the Grinch's heart. And I just can't breathe and I need to get out of the room so quickly. Why did I come to church tonight? I tell you, there's a good reason why I came to church tonight. Because this is what we need. My friend, our relationship with God, our relationship with other people, those are so important. And God says, listen, how are you going to impact a people if you do not have a right relationship with people or a right relationship with God? Look at what it says in chapter 5 and verse number 1 as we bridge the two chapters. He says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Number 3, when you love Jesus, listen, you will love others who are of Jesus. 
Now, here's what I'm about to do. I'm about to take you to Luke chapter 9 and maybe discuss something that kind of is hard to grasp. Because in our modern day, we see something that even went on in Jesus' day. There's people out there who are different than us. But what is the big deal is that they are born again. And these people I'm talking about are born again believers, but they may be a little different flavor than what we are. You know, the Bible speaks about how I'm to treat them. Amen. Look with me at Luke chapter 9, and let's begin at verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. You see, it's very easy for us to get a little jealous that somebody else is doing what we are supposed to be doing. And when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, or when we're not being used doing what we are supposed to be doing, we can put up this guard and say, well, they must not be right because they're not exactly the right flavor. Look at what Jesus says. As we read verse 49 again, John answered and said, Master, we saw one cast out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. Jesus, there's this man over there. He's casting out devils. He's doing it in your name. But he's not following us in you. He's not around us. He's over there. He's doing his own thing, but he's doing it in your name. Look at verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is Jesus, I can't believe you. Ah. You know, Jesus had a way of speaking that, you know, it wasn't always lovey-dovey like some people make him out to be. Sometimes when Jesus spoke, it was very pointed and to the heart. I know there's people out there that I don't agree with in ways that they do things and how they lead and etc. Hey, but isn't that the reason why I'm an independent Baptist anyways? I should be caring more about the, the under-shepherd responsibility of Crossroads Baptist Church than picking a fight with somebody else down the road because my name is independent. Do you realize that the Baptists were the first non-denominationalists stepping out and becoming in this... Listen, it's always funny to me how we're non-denominational, but really non-denominationalism has become a denomination. But listen... If they profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, their flavor might be a little bit different. We may have good reason for why we don't do what they do. But let me listen to Jesus' words and bring it all the way back to 2017. If they are for us, then they are not against us. Forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And I'd be better off just instead of opening my mouth against somebody who professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'd be better off, how about this, praying for them? Laboring to see fruit that abounds? Man, I tell you what, I was talking with Miss Linda a little bit earlier before church started, and yeah, we were talking about the fact that one of these days we're going to get to heaven and there's going to be people there Oh, don't all... Oh, oh who didn't just have the name Independent Baptist to them. <laughs> My Bible never says anywhere that to get to heaven, you've got to be an Independent Baptist or follow this line or this creed or this doctrine. Listen, my friend, I, I, I could say it like uh, Curtis Hutz of the past. I was Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. I'm a Baptist. I don't see the need to change the name or move on. But before I'm a Baptist, you know who I am? I'm a Bible believer and I say that till the day that I die. Amen. Amen. Believing the word of God and following his truth. Listen, just because somebody is Baptist doesn't mean that they're following the Bible or Bible believers. There's a Baptist church in New York City that's got a homosexual pastor. You can't find that allowance in the word of God. 
You can't expect that wherever you go, you step into a church with a certain name. It's going to be a Baptist church, or it's going to be a Presbyterian, or it's going to be a Methodist, or whatever. But if there's somebody that's truly born again, if there's somebody that in the name of Jesus is serving, I would be better off leaving that type of judgment up to God and treating it as Jesus would want me to treat. Don't forbid them. Don't try to stop them. If they're not against us. Wow. Jesus kind of addresses a topic that's pretty big nowadays, doesn't he? Then I want to address this as we go back to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. In 1 John chapter 4, this is the commandment we have from him, verse 21. He, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. In chapter 5, verse number 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. I can love somebody else that professes Jesus. Doesn't matter what their denomination is. I can love them and I should love them. I should not hate them for if I hate them, the love of God is not dwelling in me. Number four, a great way to examine one's love for God is found in verse number two through three. Look at what it says. By this we know that we love the children of God. Pastor, how do I know that I'm loving the children of God? When we love God and keep His What? For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. Listen, we live in a day where there's so much preaching out there against the commandments of God. And to a certain aspect and degree, listen, we are not saved by the works of the law or the works of the flesh. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we are born again. But a believer understands the standard. A believer understands the commandment. There is a a structure system to God. Take your Bible and go to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. In John chapter 13, as we're dealing with John's Gospel, then as we go to 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, the same man is used by the inspiration of the Spirit of God to pin down these books that we look at in the Bible. And in John chapter 13, we read this in verse 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have, what? Love one to another. That's how the world out there is going to know that you're one of God's. Uh, You don't need a name tag on for people to know you're one of God's. You need love toward one another. It's just that simple. Then go with me to the next chapter, chapter 14, and look with me at verse number 15. The Bible says, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Then look at John chapter 15, verses 9 through 10. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. That's what we are talking about tonight. The love that is perfected, the love being important, continuing in the love of God. Then he says in verse number 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So as we ask the question, what are these commandments? I'm so glad you asked. Go to Matthew 22 with me real quick. Matthew 22. I hope you have these verses memorized as well. In Matthew 22, there's the, you know, this situation where a Pharisee comes up to the situation and uh, this lawyer and he's asking what is, to, what is the greatest commandment. And as he deals with what is the greatest commandment, we find that there is an answer to what the greatest commandment is. As we talk about the greatest commandment, we are dealing with the fact that the greatest commandment is that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Look at verse 37 of chapter 22. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law. And the prophet's friend, we don't have a ton to remember. We've got two of these commandments that will help keep us in the love of God and reveal that we are of him by the way we love our God with our whole being and by the way we love our neighbors even as ourself. My verse for this past week and a way that I've been trying to apply to my life is that verse about the Son of Man. The fact that Jesus did not come to be ministered unto, but he came to minister. And I made a post about it earlier and said that's been my verse as a father, that's been my verse as a husband, that's been my verse as a pastor. What can I do this week for someone else that is going to show that I am not here? here to be waited on I'm not here to say feed me my grapes I am not here for people to serve me but I am here to minister to other people and can you imagine what it was like to be Jesus actually fulfilling that the Bible teaches us on one particular day of Jesus and the disciples that it came to evening time and they had not eaten yet because of how much they were doing for God. I don't know if I can honestly remember the last time that I missed a meal. Because it was getting on so much that there was so much counseling, so much praying, so much to do. Closest I've been to that's in India. Where there is 400 people gathered uh, to, uh, to, to the open air spot at the, uh, at, 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 at the college there, uh, Kota Gudam Palawancha area in, in the state of Andhra Pradesh. And, and we're there and all these people come from the community and we got this big old pot. Listen, you thought your grandma's cook pot was big. This pot was this big around, sitting on an open fire, filled with rice. They were making a ton of rice. We would preach, we would sing, we would preach, and afterwards, people would just line up to have you come pray with them about something. They didn't even understand it. They just wanted somebody to pray for them. Now, I understand that you can err falsely in that side like it's some kind of magical prayer that that white American pastor has that is prosperous and maybe if he touches my head and prays over me I'll be that way there can be that but the closest I've ever been to such a ministry that continued and continued and continued till you missed a meal was there I wonder what it would be like in America if it was like that whoa I know that Jesus was healing people. I, I know that he was making the blind eyes to see and doing things for them. But you know, I hear about these places overseas where, where nurses go and they sit there and they'll stay up all day and they actually have those opportunities uh, to help somebody, whether chiropractically or medicinally. And they get up from sundown and at, at, or at su sunrise and at sundown they're turning people away and they use those opportunities to give the gospel. Praise the Lord for that. But how would we react if we had an opportunity to minister like that? As we close this message, I just simply want to say that love is important. And as a pastor, I want you to know that I want to love you the way that I should love you. And that I want to love you with a love that amazes. And I hope that you know that with anything that you're going through, you can come. I want to be approachable. We can pray together. We can work through it. We can see God glorified in a situation. Sometimes there's separation that happens, but nobody ever understood what was going on. I'm thinking of one situation a long time ago where something so drastic happened, and next thing you know, there was nobody there. Just a situation I heard of as I was traveling evangelism, but it all could have been, could have been mended if someone would have just said, I have this hardship in my life, and I need someone to bear that burden with me. Bannisters, you'll never know how 
God has used you already to this day in people's lives. You never know what God has coming. So it's kind of like that song I heard one time. Don't give up. Don't stop now. There's a crown of life awaiting for the one who will not bow. Oh, you must be strong. You must press on. There's a crown of life awaiting. And friend, if we could just understand that we're here for a purpose. But let our motive be the motive of true charity and love. Maybe there's somebody tonight that maybe there's at odds between you and a family member, immediate family member. Your home is on shaky ground. It's about time that that love for God and love for horizontal relationships gets worked out. Maybe there's something between you and another family in church. It's about time. Maybe you search your heart and everything's okay. Praise the Lord for that. Sometimes people think that, oh, I'm struggling in my relationship and if I just move, yeah. Or if I just get this better job with more money, yeah, that'll fix it. Or if I, if I just go to the right church, that'll make it right. No. It will never be right until the problem itself is addressed. You've got to pull it out. I have that bush. Ugh. If you went over to my house, you'll see a bush that's about this tall now, about this big around. But a couple years ago, because I didn't have the right tools, I took out whatever I had in the garage and just started beating away at that thing. Oh, I got the green leaves gone. I got the twigs and sticks off of it. I got it all the way down to just wood. There was nothing there that I could see. But there was still something there. And now you go back and you see it's back. You can beat at your situation all you want to. You can try to make it change. But until the root of the problem is taken care of, the problem is still there. It just may not seem as big anymore. But it will show its ugly head again. Let's get back to the truest motive and purest motive of all. The motive of charity. The motive of love. Let's pray.